This is the Messiah Hour with Ari Lewis. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Messiah Hour here on Israel Sports News Radio. Thank you for joining us. At any time, feel free to email the program, messiahhour at gmail.com, or you can email the station at Israel Sports News Radio at gmail.com. Jonathan Pollard paroled on November 20th on a Friday, was able to spend Shabbat with his family. But what are the conditions of his parole? And why did the man spend 30 years in prison? Here to discuss this is Israel Sports News Radio's North American correspondent, Leslie Ann Stoffel. Leslie, welcome back to the program. Uh, Thanks, Ari. It's great to talk to you. Absolutely. So let's first get into the conditions of his parole. A lot of people think that he is completely free. Is that the case? Actually, no, Ari. You know, I I was um, doing some research uh, on this topic just so before I spoke to you, and you know, I I don't I don't get uh, emotional and, and feel like crying <laughs> very easily. You know, I mean, I see a lot of ugly stuff on a daily basis from uh, with what I do, and you know, this this broke my heart because they. They are stopping his the conditions are that he is um, on, on a curfew f- from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. in the morning. And he has to wear um, uh, one of those GPS bands on his leg. Um, he, the, the, the part that made me really, really sad and was that they, this means that he isn't able to enjoy a Shabbat dinner with friends and family because of his these restrictions and that was like a stab in the heart for me i i I just couldn't believe that and then also because his his um any anything that he has like a a computer or whatever phone i guess it has to be monitored at all times and he had a a job um an analyst job with a finance uh, company and they, they have now withdrawn their um their job proposal to him because it will put their company at risk having his um, equipment monitored. Um, uh, let's see now, what else? Um, Gil Hoffman of the Jerusalem Post, from what I understand, I, I know Gil, he's been one of the, the biggest um, supporters of Jonathan Pollard uh, along with you. And he, uh, from when I used to listen to Gil's show on Voice of Israel, he said that he's done like he's done some most of the reporting and writing on this case, and um, he he's the one that that I read about in the Jerusalem Post about the the issue with uh, the job and the monitoring and, and things like that, and and uh, um, Jonathan Pollard's lawyer is saying his client still is not free because of these uh, these restrictions um, so yeah so those those are some of the some of the things that I found out did you find out anything else Ari well also this we mentioned you were talking about not using the internet you talk about 7 p.m. he's not allowed to move on and then the brace which affects his Shabbat observance and I yeah. want to go to something we discussed in the summer about Jonathan Pollard used potentially as a chess piece with negotiations mm-hmm. between Obama and Netanyahu. Now that he's quote-unquote pardoned, he's released, is the fact that he has these restrictions another part of the chess game? To say something to the fact, you give us this, we'll let him go, we'll let him go to Israel, etc. Do you think that is part of the idea? Well, you know, I, I, really, I really do. Um, of course, I can't. I can't prove that, but I, I do. When it comes to the Obama administration, absolutely nothing. I would put nothing past that man. It, to me, I, I might. I, I don't think I'm overstating it when I th- say that I think he's diabolical, and he does anything and everything to be petty and vindictive, and also, you know, put the screws to Israel. And I and I think he's doing. He is using this. He's using him for this. Um, there is something very, very, you know. It just sort of cr- came crushing in on my spirit, in even like a physical way, when I read these things. I thought, you know, there's something very, very wrong here, and something quite sadistic, even in a way, too. It it, it just had a terrible, terrible um, sense about the whole thing. 
Right, because people out there, and I'm going to get to some of the arguments that were made on my Facebook post throughout this week, but some of the people may say, well, he's a spy for security reasons, blah, blah, blah. Come on. The guy did espionage in the early 80s, and yeah. when he did it, there was no internet. He is way behind, people. He's way behind. He's not going to be doing any spy stuff now. Believe me, yeah. you don't need to put electric brace on him. You don't need to restrict his internet privileges or have him uh, you know, under a curfew like he's a 14-year-old. They just, like Leslie yeah. said, it's sadistic measures to make the example even further, to tease him. Hey, you're not really free. We're just kind of teasing you. And I want to go in particular to the amount of time he spent in prison, 30 years, people, 30 years, when the average sentence for espionage to an ally, that's the crime he was convicted of. He was not convicted of any other crime. The average sentence is two years. The maximum before Jonathan Pollard was four years. So I want to touch yeah. a bit about the prison sentence. Why was he in prison so long when the precedent yeah. is four years at a maximum? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, well – that's the other thing. I, I try to listen to lots of different voices when I'm, you know, researching and looking at an issue. And the one, you know, one of the people is Gil Hoffman, like I say. And Gil's a very, um, you know, uh, clear thinking, uh, non uh, sort of, you know, uh, fanatical type person. And he has been quite vocal about. You know that they it was very it was overdone that this the, the sentencing for him and I've also listened to Dershowitz you know um, another very clear thinking rational human being who is um, a lawyer and is has an extremely sharp and clear mind so uh, Dershowitz has been very vocal uh, Alan Dershowitz has been very vocal about how this sentence I thought I heard him one time I could be wrong on the numbers but you know like I mean I think he said eight to nine years was the absolute maximum that anyone has ever gotten for this sort of a, a crime and, well just just um, to interrupt you real quickly uh, actually what he said was that he should get eight years at a maximum not uh, more but the previous right. precedent has been four years that was the uh, longest yeah. second sentence before Jonathan Pollard yeah 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 so um so it, it, it's, it's, it's very clear. I mean, it, 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 to me, it's very, very clear that, that this man has been punished to the point of breaking up. I honestly don't know how after uh, enduring 30 years of this sort of um, draconian, uh, cruel treatment for something, when you look at the other – you know, people who have, have had these sentences compared to him. And then now having these uh, restrictions and, and, and things on, on him that, that, that take away from his ability to make a living, take, a, uh, take away from his ability to have, have interactions with family and friends and to, to have part of his Jewish faith within his life, which is Shabbat, um, you know, and to wear this – bracelet and you know just to add insult to injury to insult to injury and pouring vinegar into a wound it, it's it's absolutely heartbreaking really it is yeah you know one of the things and this is all kind of weird but it almost was better when he was in prison because at least he, he didn't have to break shabbat um i mean obviously there are more pros about him being outside but uh that is something to consider and i want to touch a bit more about this uh, jail sentence because again i've had a lot of Negative comments were a surprise from Jews, saying Jonathan Pollard broke an oath. Jonathan Pollard did this X, Y, and Z. He was mm -hmm. convicted of the following crime: espionage to an ally, not espionage to an enemy. Espionage to an enemy is a whole different ballgame. Espionage mm -hmm. to an ally, as I mentioned, average sentence two years, maximum four before Jonathan Pollard. One of the reasons why, or the theories of why he spent more time in prison, was because he was blamed by Casper Weinberger for mm -hmm. crimes that Aldridge Ames committed, not Jonathan Pollard. And I hate to say this, this is something kind of weird to say, but the people that put Jonathan Pollard in prison at the end of the day were Jews. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, yeah. one of the two judge or three judge panel, two that voted for uh, Pollard to have the plea agreement not ripped up, and which should, uh, excuse me, to ripped up and have the longer sentence. If you look at the originally, Jonathan Pollard agreed to be sentenced for the crime of espionage and ally. They made a plea agreement. The judge ripped it up and gave him life imprisonment, which was illegal, but no lawyer picked it up on it. So let's talk about what will occur going forward. The pardon is, excuse me, I keep saying pardon. The parole is five years. 
Will he get to Israel before the five years or after the five years? What do you think will happen? Oh, my gosh. That was another thing. I, even, I forgot to even mention that part. Yeah, that he can't go to Israel. That's really important. Um, excuse me because it's earlier for me. But uh, uh, that's what I thought when I was reading this. I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, this is like a race against time now. Like, that's how I felt inside. I thought, oh, my gosh, like, will he get to Israel? Oh, man, like, I, I hope he does. I really do. Um I just hope maybe everybody can just pray that he does because, uh, wow, that that's that's just unbelievable that he's being stopped from even from doing that as well. And you know, Ari, oh, I'm so glad you brought this up because I found an article in Aish that's written by a rabbi Benjamin Black, and he did this comparing and contrasting thing about how the U.S. does not want him to go to Israel because. They don't want his him to be celebrated there because it's sort of like a slap in the face to the U.S. If if people you know um, uh, you know make a big deal and and celebrate him being there and stuff like that, and the and the author went down and he said he said here, um, let me just read it because it's really interesting. He said. The United States was afraid to release Pollard earlier and continues to be afraid to let him now immigrate to Israel because there might be some who will publicly express approval for, for his past actions. And the highest priority must be given to prevent criminals from, be, from becoming lionized. And then he says he contrasts with this. He says, but, w but with this galling hypocrisy, that is a policy which America chose for itself but never deemed necessary when it came to Israel. For years, the United States has pressured Israel to release Palestinian prisoners as a goodwill gesture, an indication that Israel truly wants a peace, wants peace, a step forward demonstrating compassion. These were not people who merely spied for a friendly ally. These were butchers of innocent civilians, men, women, and children, and infants. These were terrorists guilty of the cruelest and most barbaric acts imaginable. At the White House, urging all too often, Israel complied, and brutal murderers became Palestinian national heroes. Release killers turned into heroic role models for a new Arab, Arab generation to be guided by hatred and brainwashed into martyrdom. And it goes on. It's, it's quite a long article, but it's on Aish, and people can read it. But there you go. I mean, that that's a perfect... Um, you know, a perfect example there of, of the hypocrisy and the um, and how uh, it, it's it's actual it's total BS, really. I mean, sorry for the language, but that's what it is. <laughs> and that is fine. Again, this is the Messiah Hour here on Israel Sports and News Radio. Email is messiahhourgmail.com. Joined by Leslie Ann Stoffel, our North American correspondent, to discuss the parole of Jonathan Pollard. I want to go a little bit to the idea that if Pollard can make it here to Israel, and by the way, if there's any rich Americans listening to this program, get this man the best medical treatment possible. We know that consistently he's been fighting against bad health, and mm -hmm. he didn't look uh, too good. Obviously, he's been in prison for 30 years, but the people in America, the Jews in America, have got to figure out a way to get this man to live at least another five years so he can make it to Israel. But if he does make it to Israel, God willing, he will, I feel like this is another not Tonsharansky. You know, for those who don't know, if you're under a rock, the Tonsharansky, a refusenik in Russia, spent time in prison for approximately 12 years, came to Israel, and was able to do a lot of good to make a lot of change. I think Jonathan Pollard could do the same. What do you think? Uh, I think so, too. I really do. He, uh, he must have, you know, some of the most incredible insights into life now after all of this. And he could, um, I, I believe he'd be, could be and would be a, a real asset to the to the um, nation of Israel and the Jewish people because you know he he's kind of symbolic in a way of of, of the struggles that the, I, I mean in my opinion people might disagree but you know the struggles that the Jewish people have been through for for thousands of years with this crushing oppression at certain times within their history you know and I mean even now as they have their own Jewish state. Uh, you know, re reconstituted in 1948, there is still that crushing oppression on the on the Jewish people because they are Jews, and this is the same with Jonathan Pollard. I mean, it it sort of you know it's a real uh, real uh, uh, example of that. I, I think, from in my opinion. All right, so a few more minutes. We'll discuss Jonathan Pollard, then move on to the Syrian refugee issue. 
Uh, we know that President Obama is supposedly in the president in the White House for about a year and some change. Let's say, I don't know, Donald Trump wins or Ruby wins, etc. Can they give him a full out pardon? They certainly can. Would they? Do you think that the next president, if uh, the president is a Republican, gives Jonathan mm-hmm. Pollard a full out pardon? Well, I think if the right people um, lobby for that to uh, say the right person, you know, say it is Trump, I don't know, or Rubio or Cruz or whoever, uh, who seem to be the front runners right now, um, perhaps, you know, if the right people went in and gave the right argument um, and we had enough people praying behind it, uh I, th- I think I think they possibly could. I do. Yeah, I mean, you know, we know there's a lot of pro-Israel people on the Republican side. I mean, Carly Fiorina said if she were to win, her first calls to Benjamin Netanyahu, assuring the relationship with Israel. Marco Rubio brought up the fact that Obama does not treat Benjamin Netanyahu or Israel as a friend, and uh, Donald Trump said a lot of pro-Israel stuff as well. I can't say for sure. Democratic president is going to give Pollard a pardon, although they say Bill Clinton was very close. Alan Dershowitz said that. So mm-hmm. who knows? But a pardon is one way to get out of this whole mess of an electric bracelet on Shabbat and can't leave his house after 7 p.m. or get a decent job or any type of job because of this whole Internet fiasco. Again, this yeah. is the Messiah Hour on Israel Sports and News Radio. The email is messiahhourgmail.com. We're speaking with Leslie Ann Stoffel. Leslie, let's move on to the Syrian refugee issue. A lot of countries are considering, contemplating, bringing in refugees. We know you are in Canada. We know Canada is thinking about doing it. Of course, Stephen Harper is out for those keeping score. What's going to happen with the refugees in Canada? Mm-hmm. Well, this was this was really, really upsetting to us um, that our new prime minister, Justin Trudeau, wanted to bring in 25,000 refugees in a very short period of time by the end of this year, like by the end of December. And um, and then and then all of a sudden the global jihad attacks happened in Paris and um, all the stuff started happening in Belgium and everything. And and actually Canadians got very, very worried. There were petitions and and um, people were contacting their members of parliament and stuff. And so um, Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's government backed down uh, and changed the rules of the of the deal, I guess you could say. And he said that they weren't going to bring in um, young males for fear that they would be jihadists. Um, that they were going to just bring in families and uh, families and children and, and, and mothers and but we all know that fa- mother mothers can be uh, suicide bombers and the children can be stabbers so anyway uh, whatever <laughs> so but we we sort of welcome this as a as a good change I mean a compromise and he also lowered the number to ten thousand until the end of December, but the, the it's still going to continue on in the next couple of months with in the new year in 2016. So, but anyway, I mean, we're still not so happy with this, but at least they've slowed it down because we were, you know, Canadians were were like really worried about security and and stuff like that, of course. But um, still, this is a problem because. There is no way to vet these people. Like our government is saying, well, they're going to be vetted over there now. Like they were going to bring them here and vet them too. And that's what people were freaked out about too because when people land here, apparently when they get here on Canadian soil, it's extremely difficult to get rid of them because of our liberal laws and, and judges and stuff like that. It's it's just a nightmare. So at least they said, okay, they would vet them over there but these people are in turkey they're in syria uh, turkey <coughs> excuse me lebanon and jordan and uh if they're, if they're wanting to supposedly um vet syrian refugees supposedly there isn't a country anymore i mean they can't go and call up a, a clerical a clerical person in assad's government and say can you tell me about this person whatever it's just you know the, the documents and and everything it's just not there because it, it, syria is in a war so and what we're also saying some of us is well if they're in a safe space now 
in those three countries. Why is it? Why is there such a rush to get them here then, if they're safe right now? Like, take the time then to, you know, do the vetting however you possibly can and check these out because it says they say that it takes like 18 months or something to vet one person, and they're trying to like do it. Ezra Levant did a show where they're like, the way they're doing it is going to be like two minutes to vet a person. <laughs> so. Anyway, we're living with this insanity, and from what I've read and heard, this is a UN plan by large lobby groups that, if Arab lobby groups that sort of run the UN, that are pushing to get all these Muslim refugees, or you know, it's it's called the Hijra. It's a it's a migration through jihad, and it's a it's it, what the end result is is to get so many Muslims within the Western countries that eventually they buckle under and have to accept Sharia law, and also it does bring jihad into these countries so that people are actually you know they're terrified to say no to this because that the, they've got like terrorists running around their countries. We we can see this happening in 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 Europe right now. People are afraid to say anything, and they're literally overrun with this lawless, insane jihadist, you know, Islamic jihadist terrorizing the populations. So, I don't know, Ari. I mean, I'm doing my best. I did a, I, I wrote um, I, with a, oh, this is an interesting part. This lady that lives in a town near me, a city near me, she heard our last interview, and she got a hold of me, and we, she wrote a, a um, a letter and she had me help her edit it and stuff and we sent it off to she, well she sent it off to a whole bunch of different MPs and I sent it uh, I did a like a, a different version and sent it to our my provincial member of the legislature here and uh, I put in there that listen you're gonna be held responsible Christy Clark if people are um, hurt because they've already warned us that they're gonna they want to hurt they want to bring ISIS has already said they want to put terrorists within these populations and here's all the proof bang 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 and I showed her and I told her like all these things that are going on within um, all the countries and stuff and even the the Syrian ambassador to India I think it was he said there's 20% jihadists within these populations and I anyway I laid this all out for her and I said listen you're gonna be held responsible and I'm gonna see about trying to get a class action lawsuit even if this and so anyway I think all the people with you know combined um, helped to at least pause this for a while but we've still got lots of work to do to try to even stem the tide even further because Canadians don't want Sharia law and we don't want jihad and we gotta you know do our best to try to stop this and whatever um, but of course, we want to help people who really need help. You know, Muslims that really need it, and Christians, Yazidis, and anybody. You know, the gay Muslims who are threatened and whatever. Um, so yeah, I mean, there are people that really need help, and we want them to be helped for sure. But we've got to do our best to keep the the jihadists uh, out, and we've got to try to make sure that the ones coming in believe in Canadian laws and values, so that they don't want to impose the Sharia law on us. And that's very hard. To, that's really hard to do. I don't know how we're going to, you know, bridge that gap. Um, so so yeah. So that's that's about that. With that. All right, again, this is the Messiah Hour on Israel Sports and News Radio. Email messiahhourgmail.com. And my guest is Leslie Ann Stolfo. We're talking now about the issue with the Syrian refugees. I think it's more of a serious issue in the United States as opposed to Canada. The United States has unique laws regarding federal law and state law. Many states, many governors are saying they will not accept Syrian refugees, even if the mm -hmm. president makes them. The president says... They cannot do that. How bad will that get in America? I don't think there will be a civil war over it, but it's pretty dangerous when you have a president yeah. fighting with states. So what's going to happen yeah. in the United States regarding Syrian refugees? Well, yeah, you just hit the nail on the head. This is so um, antagonistic because Obama, I, I think I just read something 
this morning before I spoke to you, or it was last night, that he is going after these governors who are saying they don't want this. He's saying, well, it's illegal for you to say that. And I mean, he's, you know, in the, in the typical Obama style, he's starting fights with Americans instead of wanting to look after the safety and security of Americans first. You know, it's just so Obama, and it just makes you want to tear your hair out. But anyway, um, it, it is dangerous, it, and it very well could. It's a powder keg. You know, people really are at the breaking point right now on this in America, you know, more so than Canadians. Canadians aren't quite so, uh, you know, they'll write a letter, whereas an American, you know, they have their guns, we have our letters. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it, it is a powder keg. It could be a potential uh, really, you know, difficult situation and could turn quite ugly if it isn't handled correctly. And of course, it won't be and isn't being handled correctly by Obama. So uh, we'll have to wait and see how that goes. I certainly hope there isn't a civil war because then Obama, you know, uh, if people rise up and he pushes them to that point, then I, I, he can, you know, ca call for um, military, oh, what's that word, uh, martial law, and uh, not even have an election. He'd have to, you know, they'd be they'd be saddled with that guy for God knows how long. Well, that's been the fear of a lot of quote unquote conspiracy theorists. I'm not per se one of them, mm -hmm. but one of the angles, one of the beliefs is that uh, President Obama will not be leaving after a second term. He will have some excuse. Yeah, I don't. I'm not saying that. But this he, certainly would I'm be an avenue that, if the yeah, but, governors yeah, choose to it, ignore him and he wants to override them. I, I don't think that yeah. will happen, but people should certainly keep an eye on it and be prepared yeah. and take get to consideration what is going on uh, very unprecedented that the president would tell states to do what to do in such a matter of security it would be one thing if yeah. it was a different type of law but if, if states do not want Syrian refugees in their states they should be allowed to not let them in again this is the Messiah yeah. Hour on Israel Sports News Radio We're joined by Leslie and so far North American correspondent and Leslie I understand that you have something to promote you'd like to discuss so please take it away Oh yeah, this is so this is so great and so fun for people to get involved and support the IDF in Israel. That's the Israeli Defense Forces. As people might know, I work for United with Israel, and every year, this is our fifth year, we have a campaign where people can buy warm clothing, uh, scarves, gloves. They're in like packages. They come together. Um, for the IDF uh, warm winter clothing packages um, and so if people go to my webpage therealclearisrael.org they'll see it right there on the front page it's they've got there's I've got a a post with a, a, a young girl an IDF soldier holding a little a little child if they click on that um, they can donate for the warm winter clothing packages for the IDF and we also have a party every year for them and so they can watch the videos from past years and get involved with that as well and unfortunately I won't be there this year for that which I was really hoping to be but I can't I was I'm having some health things going on so I've got to wait until I get that sorted out to come to Israel which I'm hoping will be very soon in the new year um, but anyway, yeah, so the IDF um, warm winter clothing and the Hanukkah party is so exciting and so much fun, and people can, can donate to that if they want to, which would be great at therealclearisrael.org. It's on my webpage. Okay, great. So, again, uh, people can check that out. Get another episode of the Messiah Hour here on Israel Sports and News Radio. Speak with Leslie Ann Stoffel about Jonathan Pollard's quote-unquote release, if you will, although it doesn't sound like much of a release. And we're speaking about the issue of Syrian refugees, where President Obama really forced states to accept Syrian refugees if they do not choose to do so. Again, if you want to make a donation to my program and to my station, you can do so. MessiahHour at gmail.com is the email. And then, of course, the PayPal is IsraelSportsRadio at yahoo.com. Again, the PayPal different than the web address. So, again, IsraelSportsRadio at yahoo.com. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Of course, thank you to my guests, Leslie Ann Stoffel. Stay safe, be well, and shalom from Israel.